Stay tuned as we showcase the people, places, and issues that matter to you on this episode of Focus. By 2018, Pennsylvania will have 300,000 job openings in the science and technology sector. See how the Lehigh Valley is preparing the workforce with our focus on education and business. Plus, we focus on health with a local marathon that draws thousands of runners and raises thousands of dollars to create opportunities for people with disabilities. It's all coming up right now on Focus. Focus is for our community. Focus showcases the people, the places, and the issues that matter to you. Focus on what matters. You never know what you're going to see when you tune into Focus. Support for Focus is provided by Univest, Banking Insurance Investments, Fellowship Community, Continuing Care with Spirit, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Thanks for joining us. I'm Laura McHugh. Coming up, we'll focus on business and education, but first we focus on health and community. 2015 marks the 25th anniversary of the Americans with Disabilities Act. Signed into law in 1990, the ADA guarantees equal opportunity for individuals with disabilities in public accommodation, employment, transportation, state and local government services, and telecommunications. For the past nine years, a Lehigh Valley Marathon has raised funds for VIA, a local nonprofit, helping people with disabilities overcome the challenges they face in their daily lives. Focus contributor Sarah Madonna has more in this Focus Spotlight on Service. On a sunny Sunday morning this September, Larry Holmes Drive in Easton became a mecca for athletes looking to test their endurance and strength at the ninth annual VIA Marathon. hardest thing I've done in my life. An event that modestly began with just 800 runners its first year has grown to over 4,000. From Bedford, Massachusetts, Robert Santa Maria, from Treasure Island, Florida. Attracting athletes from all over the world. We come all this way because it's a very friendly route. It's a course that is very uh, appropriate. While many enjoy the challenge of the marathon and the beer tent afterwards, the purpose for the event is to raise money and support for the mission of VIA of Lehigh Valley. Helping people with disabilities become independent, uh, find the supports in life that they need, and live a quality life. For decades, people with disabilities in the Lehigh Valley area have depended on VIA services, providing support for children to seniors. The day of the marathon, we caught up with Deidre Sobel, who stood at the finish line with a smile, handing runners their hard-earned prize. I'm volunteering like I see I was over there when I was giving out medals and stuff like that for VIA. Deidre has teamed up with VIA for the past five years, providing her with meaningful volunteer work. It makes me feel good, it makes me feel great inside, it makes me feel awesome. Thank you. She wants to be part, she wants to make everybody proud, and she wants to be successful, and that's really the heart of why I do what I do. And Sobel is a part of a lot of things. Meals on Wheels, Westminster Village here at the church. Sobel helps clean the church from top to bottom, scrubbing pews and wiping down marble, skills that one day her coordinator hopes will help her transition to a paying job. I feel that they need to be part of the community. It's their community too. And with volunteering, it prepares them for employment. That is at the heart of what VIA does. We believe that everybody is employable and that if you want to work, there is something that you can do. Um, it's just a matter of finding what that is. For someone with a disability, that could be challenging. VIA Employment Coordinator Stephanie May says often stereotypes, stigmas, and communication can prevent a prospective employee from landing a job that they are fully capable of doing. Amanda Donches knows this firsthand. Hey, hard time. Who is up? 
With help from Via, Donchez put her skills to the test at a number of jobs before deciding cooking was her passion. With Via's help, she got hired at Pandini's restaurant at the Promenade Shops two years ago. She now cooks pasta dishes, sautés vegetables, and mixes sauces. It makes me feel good to do what I love to do. While in September, as runners pounded the pavement, they did more than run 26 miles. They helped raise money to continue giving more people more opportunities to succeed. The money raised does not just have a positive effect on Sobel or Donchez or anyone trying to move forward in life with a unique challenge. In turn, they touch the lives of those they meet. I could be having the world's worst Tuesday when they show up to help volunteer. Um, and I always have to stop and just pause and smile knowing that the positive impact that they have um, not only on the volunteer work that they do for the community but the positive impact that they have on people's lives is so changing. For Via, changing perceptions may be the real marathon. For Focus, I'm Sarah Madonna reporting. To learn more about this issue, I'm now joined by Greg Bott, the Director of Development for the Lehigh Valley Center for Independent Living. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me on. So 25 years ago, what was this community like for people living with disabilities prior to the passage of the Americans with Disabilities Act? Very, very different. Um, 25 years ago, before the ADA, um, people with disabilities were really institutionalized. Um, they were cast out from society um, and really, in most cases, people with disabilities were treated worse than criminals, in, in all honesty. Um, so before the ADA, there was, there was really no protection, no laws. There were there some things. There's the Rehab Act of 1973 and some other things in place that can help, you know, help to protect people with disabilities and provide them services. But other than that, there really wasn't, wasn't anything as far expanding and as, as broad as the ADA um, to really help people with disabilities achieve their dreams and do whatever they really wanted to do in life. I understand your founder uh, played a very instrumental role in the passage of ADA. Absolutely. He, uh, our founder was Carl Odner. Uh, he, was a, he worked at Good Shepherd and he was also just a local champion of, of the disability rights movement, uh, what, what's called the independent living movement. And um, he, he uh, established a group back in 1973 actually called Operation Overcome. So it was a local advocacy group. Uh, people with disabilities and their friends advocated for uh, just equal treatment, equal rights. Um, they helped uh, pass, you know, things to help improve the accessibility of Allentown school districts way before the ADA. Um, they did a very famous uh, event called the Roll in the Mall, um, which helped to, uh, you know, really bring to, bring to the attention of the local community officials, public officials, uh, the accessibility of the Allentown uh, Hamilton Street District. So that was way back in 1973, and that advocacy continued right up to the uh, the establishment of our organization, which we were founded on June 12th in uh, 1990 and the ADA was signed into law on uh, July 26, 1990. And so how have we seen our community change since then? Things have gotten a lot better um, in terms of accessibility, I will say. Uh, you know, there, there's still many, many things that can be done. Uh, you know, uh, anybody that lives in the Allentown or commutes in the Allentown region right now knows that they're doing all types of construction on Tillman Street and you probably see, you know, all the new curb cuts and things like that going in, all the construction that's happening in downtown Allentown all the curb cuts and other things the, to improve accessibility. So that, that's really helping. That's helping quite a bit uh, for people with disabilities to go out and enjoy, enjoy their life, you know, do everything that anybody should, have, anybody should be able to do what they want. Um, so that has really helped. Um, but people with disabilities, you know, despite 25 years of the ADA, still face discrimination in areas like fair housing, uh, afford, finding affordable and accessible housing, discrimination from landlords, um, you know, discrimination in employment, things like that. So. Although we have the ADA uh, and that's in place and that's really helping to protect and you know helping to pave the way for the future, um, we still have a lot of work to do and I think that's what makes organizations like ours and organizations like, uh, like VIA and other organizations, the ARC, uh, that makes the work that we do so great and makes it, makes it possible because we, what we want to do is we want to help people with disabilities live independently and, and achieve their dreams. You know, when you say independent living, a lot of people think of housing, and that is a main part of your services, Absolutely. but you do a lot of, uh, a multitude of things. Absolutely. So uh, share with us the main uh, programs that you offer. Sure, okay, uh, well, what we do, as a Center for Independent Living, we provide four core services. So that is independent living skills education, peer support, advocacy, and, uh, and information and referral. So 
There are more than 700 uh, centers for independent living throughout the nation, actually. We're one of 18 in Pennsylvania. We all do those same four core services, but we all have our own little niche in our community. So we provide, like you said, in, in addition to housing, uh, we provide things like uh, job coaching services for young adults with disabilities. Uh, we provide uh, support for youth with disabilities who are making that transition from high school to adult life uh, to uh, whether that's you know post-secondary education or the workforce. Um, we provide a statewide program to help uh, you know places improve their accessibility, things like that. Up at Hawk Mountain recently, they they built that new ADA accessible trail. We're uh, we helped out with that. So provide a multitude of services. You know, it's really all based on what our community needs, um, and I think that's what makes us a unique organization that we really are in tune with our community. And the other thing that's really important about our organization too is that um, we are the core principle of Center for Independent Living is that. People with disabilities can do anything, and 50% uh, 50%, 50, uh, percent or more of our board, of our staff, of our volunteers are people with disabilities. So, you know, as a person with a disabil dis uh, disability myself, too, I think that's really important because that helps establish a relationship with our consumers, and it really helps to, you know, we, we understand things a little bit better. Um, that just helps our services and, you know, helps the quality of our service. What do you consider to be the number one issue facing people with disabilities in our community right now? Ooh, that's a that's a tough one. Um, affordable housing is always a huge mm -hmm. issue. Um, you know, we have a deficit of about twelve thousand uh, affordable housing units. So that means that there's twelve thousand units are needed. Affordable housing units are needed, pretty much. And that's you know that's not just for people with disabilities. That's across everyone who's living on limited income or struggling with homelessness. Um, so definitely, affordable housing is one of the main issues that we see. And uh, you know we, we deal a lot with veterans too. We work a lot with veterans with disabilities and their family members. So you know, as as our our heroes come over from overseas, and you know if they come back with a disability or combat related disability, you know a lot of times they are they're struggling. And uh, that's what organizations like ours and and some of the other organizations out there they help provide those services as well. So you know it's it's and it's all tied to housing. Uh, a lot of a lot of issues are tied to housing. But the the important thing is you can't maintain a house if you don't have a job. So uh, everything kind of leads into one, uh, the next thing. So uh, employment is a whole other issue too. That's that's really facing people with disabilities, and you know, especially young adults. You know, especially uh, young people that are graduating from college or, or graduating from high school, rather, but exploring college or not, going to the workforce. So uh, yeah, do, those are definitely two issues that are definitely hand in hand. And finally, Greg, uh, who are some of the main uh, pro partners that you have in accomplishing these goals? Sir, uh, we have we work a lot with uh, actually with the Department of Education at the state. Um, we work with uh, a lot of different organizations. The, uh, the Office of Vocational Rehabilitation here locally in Allentown at the state level too. We work a lot with. Um, we are partnered with a group called the Partnership for Disability Friendly Community, which is pretty much a, a gathering of all different organizations uh, that provide services for people with disabilities, and we all work together and try to help you know make the community a little bit more friendly for people with disabilities. Thanks so much. You're welcome. The theme of collaboration continues in our next story as we focus on education and business and how a special program brings together private and nonprofit partners to create a working solution to a workforce shortage. Here's Brittany Garzillo with the story. Thanks, Laura. According to a report by the United States Department of Commerce, the manufacturing sector added 646,000 jobs from February 2010 to May of 2014. The growing number has some local businesses and organizations taking action to educate and inspire students about the future of manufacturing. Twenty-nine-year-old Andrea Giovanni from Kunkeltown helps make engineered models come to life. And then this is my version that I did with Victolic fittings. Andrea is a proposal coordinator at Victolic, a global pipe coupling manufacturer headquartered in Forks Township. What I do is I take things that were originally drawn one way and I change them into the way that my company creates our products. She's also part of a group called the Dream Team. Not exactly a superhero, but a super role model for students interested in science, technology, engineering, and math. My interest started in this field when I was a little kid and my dad would have a big important job to do and he'd bring home his drawings and set them on the dining room table. 
According to Dream It, Do It PA, a partnership directed by the Manufacturers Resource Center in Allentown, nationwide, Pennsylvania has the seventh highest need for STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math professionals like Andrea, with an estimated 314,000 projected jobs by 2018. STEM education is so important for, you know, for the children of Pennsylvania because it's really what, it's what's going to drive our future. Pennsylvania's Secretary of Education, Pedro Rivera, recognizes the importance of STEM education for students throughout the Commonwealth. In celebration of Pennsylvania's Manufacturing Week at the end of September, Secretary Rivera and students from Parkland High School toured Bosch Rexroth in Bethlehem for a look at Lehigh Valley industry. As we know, everything uh, you know that we engage in today has something to do with or is aligned to science, technology, engineering, or math. And by better embracing, understanding, and engaging in STEM activities, students will be better prepared to change our world. Dream It, Do It PA puts that power in the hands of eighth grade students with a video contest designed to excite students about careers in manufacturing. What's so cool about manufacturing? The ultimate goal is to introduce students to today's manufacturing environment and to encourage them to consider manufacturing careers as one of their options. With the help of a GoPro camera, teacher, coach, and company employee like Victolic's Andrea Giovanni, also known as a Dream Team member, students enter area manufacturers to answer the question, what's so cool about manufacturing? My biggest reason why we're doing it is, is to hopefully develop uh, you know, a talent pipeline here in the Lehigh Valley and other areas that we're doing this. Uh, one of the biggest problems in manufacturing right now is finding talent. And you will go there for a half day and you will do your filming. In September, teachers from schools across Lehigh, Northampton and Bucks counties gathered inside PBS 39's studio to kick off the contest's third year. The whole process is a learning process for the students, so they're getting out into companies, uh, seeing an aspect of life that maybe they've never considered. It's really focusing on 21st century skills. Um, they're working together, it's creative, um, it's collaborative, they're using technology. The 30 student teams begin filming their two-minute video profiles in November and will compete against one another during an awards ceremony in February of 2016. We want them in eighth grade to take those STEM classes and maybe consider career and technical education. It's always great to keep an open mind, even if it's in a field that you never thought you would ever be in. I never thought I would work at a foundry, and now I love it. So much, she inspires others to dream it and do it in PA. For Focus, I'm Brittany Garzillo reporting. Thank you, Brittany. It's now my pleasure to introduce two more members of the Dream Team. Chris Hippel is a manufacturing engineer at Bosch Rexroth, and Avery Henthorne is a machinist at Lehigh Valley Plastics. Thank you both for joining us. Thank you for having Thank us. You. Chris, let's start with you. How did you get interested in this field? Uh, it's, well, I got into manufacturing because Bosch was at a career fair at my school, which I went to Lafayette College for mechanical engineering. So. Straight out of college, I took a job there and I've been there since. So how did you know you wanted to study engineering in college? It was a toss-up for me <laughs> between engineering and physics. And I ended up going with engineering and enjoyed it, so I stayed with it. But I was always in some sort of uh, physical or applied sciences. Avery, how did you get involved in manufacturing? I got involved in manufacturing through Bethel Mary Vocational Technical School. I was uh, a machinist there, and I actually got out on the workforce through a co-op program, and I was just carried on through, through it ever since. Both of you in your 20s, Avery, why would you recommend uh, this field to a young person? Oh, it's a great field. Um, there's a lot of points to excel and grow in whatever, whatever uh, position you choose to be in. You know, you use that word grow, and Chris, I, I noticed in a video that I watched about you that you talk about all those growth opportunities as well. Yeah, definitely. Within manufacturing, there's so many different pieces that have to come together throughout the entire process, and when you're working in manufacturing, you're exposed to every one of those. So from where you are and where you're interested in and where your skills line up, you can push your career in that direction. So there's lots of different opportunities all throughout the path to you know, find what fits for you and do what you really enjoy. And through being exposed to all that, you're learning a ton of new things practically every day. So that's very nice. 
So Chris, why did you want to get involved in the Dream Team? It seemed exciting. It seemed something new, interesting, mostly, and a chance to help other people. And, and Avery, for you, what's been the best part of being a part of the Dream Team so far? Uh, to branch off of what Chris said, I am definitely interested in helping the kids out because um, I knew when I was in middle school, uh, high school, I didn't know what I wanted to be, and it really helped me for what I wanted to do with my life. And uh, what's been the best part for you? We went to, this was not exactly part of the Dream Team, but with another coworker, I spoke at a middle school for, to probably 50 or so kids at a STEM camp, and they were just really interested. We were talking about what we did at Bosch and the technology in general. We got a lot of really good questions from them, and they were really interested. So it was, it was very rewarding to speak to them and you know, show them this, this is happening here in the Valley, and you can be a part of this. So Chris, tell me more about what you do as a manufacturing engineer. OK, so I look at and do and drive projects all along the entire manufacturing process. So from when parts come in the door to when we ship them out, whether I'll be looking at refining the entire process or one specific task within it. So maybe designing a whole line or designing a specific tool or teaching people how to do something. It's all part of the job. So it's technical work, it's communication, and there's a lot of problem solving and figuring things out. So good variety. And, and, and Avery, what does a machinist do? I run and set up, operate CNC machines. I take a raw material and produce it into the finished product that would be used in the, manufa um, the crane industry, uh, construction industry, um, medical industry. It varies everything. And your mm -hmm. videos are available on dreamitdoitpa.com. Mm -hmm. So Avery, Chris, thank you both for joining us and for telling us more about manufacturing jobs. Thank you. Well, thank you for joining us. We'll see you next week for a special focus report on the local food economy. Until then, remember to focus on what matters.